Today we have Kate, and she is an HR guru. Um, Kate, you want to tell us about who, what, and where, and all that goodness about you? Yeah, I'm Kate Hennyberger. I'm coming to you from Burke, Virginia, suburbs of DC. Uh, I've been out here for about seven years, uh, originally from Arizona, where I started my career. So I understand a lot of the West Coast issues um, when it comes to HR. I've been doing HR for about, so I counted yesterday, and I was like, uh, 14 years. So wow. yeah, <laughs> I've earned these gray hairs. <laughs> um, <laughs> that are my kids who might barge in. I don't live with elephants. They're just three and six and very loud. Um, so yeah, I have my... I have my two senior HR certifications. I went to school for history, thought I wanted to go to law, then I didn't want to pay for law school, so I did HR. So here I am. <laughs> nice. All right, so we're going to break our conversation up into two parts. And the first mm -hmm. one is all about hiring, and the second part is all about firing and possibly rehiring and things like that. So, okay, so what are some of the common areas where a business runs into issues with their hiring? process? I would say there's three common areas that I see over and over again that open you up to vulnerabilities. And the first is not having an accurate job description. So make sure that you put the have to haves and the nice to haves, the schedule, if it's non-negotiable, they have to work Saturdays, make sure that's in there. If they have to be able to lift 50 pounds, make sure it's in there. Okay. Um, a good solid job description is going to take you from cradle to grave with an employee. So wow. they go out on workers comp, you're going to have to give them that job description. Um, you're doing performance evaluations, you're going to need that job description. This is kind of like your foundation for the employee. So okay. that's the first area. The second area is interviewing. I have had the sweetest, nicest, most best intentioned managers mess up terribly in an interview where they'll ask, oh, do you have kids? And then the person doesn't get a job. This happened actually about a year ago. We didn't end up hiring that person. And they came back and tried to claim that we, for discrimination, because they had children, because they couldn't work on over the weekends. So it wasn't, right. thankfully we took a lot of notes for each interview and we asked them the same interview questions for everybody. Um, and so we were able to show that that wasn't the reason that we actually hired someone who was better qualified. So that's the second thing that I would say. And the third is um, probably having no training plan when they come in. Um, it's really engaging when someone starts at a new company and they know who they're supposed to shadow or what systems they're supposed to be training on. And they have like a plan as opposed to just coming in and sitting there watching the office work. So <laughs> it's like you're paying them, you know, start using them. So I would say those are probably the big three areas. Um, so we got them hired. So what forms should be in their new hire packet? So in their new hire packet, you should have their I-9. Okay. Um, you should have their job description, any of the EEO self-identification forms, um, the veteran status form, the disability form set. There's so many forms I had to make a list, which I can email to you if you want to email it to anybody else. Sure. Um, the offer letter, which outlines start date, salary, all that fun stuff. Um, w-4, and then there's state tax income, if there is one form. Any payroll information, direct deposit information, um, you can keep the way to check in there if you want. I will say, and then eventually as they are your employee for a period of time, you'll put their performance reviews, um, disciplinary actions, things like that. You can all keep in that folder. Um, you should ideally have three folders for your employees though. Okay. You should have one folder with all of your employees' I-9 documents in it. In case ICE comes knocking on your door, they're going to want, you need to be immediately able to just give them that file so they're not going through the rest of your files. Okay. Um, if you want to talk ICE protocol, let me know. <laughs> but <laughs> don't let them back by your files. Keep them out front. <laughs> Tell your front desk people to say, one second, and you just give them the file. And Anyway, moving on. You should have a benefits folder in case you do offer benefits. I think um, the Affordable Care Act doesn't require you to if you're under 50 people. 
But if you do offer benefits for your employees, you should keep their benefits information separate. You should keep um, workers' comp claims, uh, FMLA paperwork, which is also 50 and under, you're not, um, you don't have to do that. Short-term disability paperwork, that kind of stuff should be kept separate. And then, and that's more for like auditing purposes. Um, and then you've got your personnel file. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and so again, I guess the question is, what's the best way to file all this stuff? So do we have a filing cabinet for each one? Can they be together on the same name, John Doe? Or uh, what does mm -hmm. that look like? So the personnel file, everyone has their own file. Okay. Um, most smaller businesses that I work with generally keep paper files. Um, so you've got, you know, your one personnel file. Each employee has their one benefits file one for each employee and then all the I-9s can be kept together. All right. So um, can, instead of an actual paper file, can you store this in Google Drive and just kind of have the folders in like a Google Drive shared document thing? Or does you it- You can. Mm -hmm. The same rule applies for electronic as it does for, not rule, it's the best practices, um, for paper files as it does for electronic files and it's the two lock rule. So you should have, at least two walls of security that require a password electronically okay. um, to access it. So it's like your laptop login and then your Google Drive login, that's fine. But it, you should probably have it set to prompt you to log in every time, unfortunately. It doesn't right. just automatically log in. And then same for your paper files. If it's in, locked in a drawer and then locked in a room is sufficient. All right, are there um, any other best practices we should should fall. Clean your I-9s out. So you should hold on to them for one year after an employee terminates. Um, personnel files, best practice is about seven years. Okay. And then you can check them. Well, destroy them. All right. Do you reissue any new paperwork annually? Um, no, the employees will let you know if they need to update their direct deposit or if they moved. Um, if their passport has expired that you used for their I-9, you can go back and update that. Uh, but no, we don't do any annual updates except for benefits. If you're doing like open enrollment and you're doing benefits annually, that's about it. Um, and then if you're rehiring someone, it all depends. So you'll have to do a new I-9 no matter what. Even if they were gone for 48 hours, you'll have because they were terminated and they were brought back on, you have to redo the I-9. And if you e-verify, you will have to e-verify them. Um, if you e-verify, it's not for, not everybody has to. Um, okay. And then you could just have them, I generally, I just pull the file and have them review their paperwork and say, okay. you know, is there anything that we need to change? Um, I, I like to keep building on their old file so that you have all of those records all together. All right. Um. How often should we conduct performance reviews, evaluations, and uh, what does that process look like? So the traditional way is the annual review, um, which is pretty ineffective because nobody likes hearing, getting feedback on something they did eight months ago. Um, and then it seemed like the trend was to go very agile where you're constantly getting feedback and it was a real heavy burden on the managers to constantly be logging it and tracking it and giving it. So best practices now, what generally everyone's doing is quarterly reviews. So okay. you are taking that job description to assess them on their day-to-day -day work. Um, you can assess them on it and evaluate them on any special projects they might be working on or any like value adds they've added to your company. And then you definitely want to be checking in with them on goals. So setting those goals and making sure they're just, just the, are, have you completed it? Are you working on it or have you not started? And just, you know, checking in with them to help keep them accountable, basically. Um, but yeah, quarterly, but they'll, everyone in, in the learning and development industry would say, you know, but keep the regular coaching conversations going as often as you can. All right. Um, how, so if you have somebody that's, doing a good job with their performance and, and all those little 
evaluations along the way? What's the best way now to promote them? Um, what's, you know, do you have a best practice for promote, promoting people? And mm -hmm. um, Well, the company has to be able to support the promotion from like a financial standpoint. Okay. Uh, I think that's probably like the critical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like your CFO at two of us. You know that doesn't really work. Right. <laughs> um, I would say how how my last several companies have done it is that we we assess the evaluation. And so, are you are you meeting, exceeding? Are you we evaluate like are you not doing it at all or are you like blowing it out of the water on a five range scale and the employee doesn't see that part it's a way for us to assess all the employees as objectively as we can nice. so that the right person is getting the promotion and so feel free to dangle the carrot and say hey you know after the, this year and you complete these goals and these tasks and you're exceeding expectations then that job is yours that is that motivates quite a lot of people so I definitely recommend doing that, but it, I, I would say definitely track it. Make sure that you would be able to show the reason why they got the promotion. I think is very important. Um, in like a discrimination case, like someone, I have been, we, I've been with uh, companies who've been sued for discrimination by employees because they didn't get the promotion. Somebody oh, wow. else being able to show that you can, you can support why is, you know, CYA, cover your ass. Right. <laughs> That's like the, the part, you take anything away. <laughs> <laughs> document, document, document. <laughs> right. I think that's the hard part though with HR is you don't know what, you think you're covering it, but you're not. And and so that's... And then there's things you cannot hold on to. Yeah. Like, like background checks. You shouldn't keep background checks on site. Oh, wow. Okay. But if you do background checks, keep them in the portal where you do them. You know, they'll archive them for you. But I wouldn't... Especially if you're like you're not the one maintaining all these files, you have an office manager or something maintaining those files. Definitely do not put those records in there. All right, so let's go back to the promotion person. Okay, so we mm -hmm. covered our ask; they're promoted. Mm -hmm. um, so we issue a new job description. Do we pull mm -hmm. the old one, or do we say this job description was superseded and now they have a new job? Um, what 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 are, what's some of that paperwork process look like? So, ideally, um, you have a form that's like a personnel action form, okay. and it'll show, you know, when they are hired, um, it'll show if they've been promoted, it'll show, and that's how you track like the date that they were promoted. So from this date forward, you're at this salary at this position. Okay. So you don't have to hold on to the old job description if you don't want to. Um, most people don't, most people toss it. But okay. as long as you have that record somewhere else, that, they, that was where they started. Got it. All right. Uh, what's kind of your system and procedures for tracking all this? Because, I mean, you work for bigger companies, you know, with hundreds of employees. But, you know, my, mm -hmm. my docs tend to have maybe at the most seven or eight employees. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what would be good ways to just track all this you know from evaluations and paperwork kind of what is it like a, is there a monthly rhythm to it is it a daily rhythm to it or once a quarter you got to go in and do this what does that look like mostly you're just adding paperwork to the files <laughs> like for smaller businesses um there there are software solutions out there for small businesses all of them are pretty expensive um most of my companies have been I have, well, under 500 people, wow. but I have, my most recent company was 20. Um, so I did everything on a SharePoint drive um, oh. in spreadsheets and then I had their files. So I had that immediate ability to look stuff up. Okay. Um, that like critical information, I didn't have to go run to the file room to get their emergency contact information or whatever. Um, so I had a I had one workbook and spreadsheet of in Excel that had this is my all the benefits information for every employee and this is not everything but you know this is what plans are on so I could quick look up as if people had questions. Got it. Um, 
But I would say the best thing to do is to sit down with that list. And I can give you a more comprehensive list that includes like the termination letters and your offer letter and things like that. And create a template. Um, the fastest way that I found to be able to get things out was mail merge. And so I would take all the that templated information that I had for a new hire and I would mail merge their name and information into all the letters and I I wasn't sitting there, you know, typing away and editing right. five letters or whatever, five different documents for them. So um, something to, to, to keep in mind is to make sure at the beginning of the year, around January 1st or the first Monday of the year, I have on my calendar to go in and pull uh, the most up-to-date I-9 form. So make sure that for any new hires, you've got the most current version, um, the state and the federal tax information, so your W-4 and I think here in Virginia, we call it a VA for um, okay. uh, make sure that you have those that, that are coming directly from the government. You have the most up to date. All right. So that would be something to do annually. All right. Um, yeah, this wasn't part of our questions. So feel free to answer as you will. But um, I care for a, a field that tends to hire a lot of docs as contractors. Mm -hmm. not employees so how, how how does how do you kind of protect yourself with that relationship um contractors working for you because you really don't have much right it seems like but um what, what would you do so you have a doctor that owns a business and he's contracting out a doctor to come in and help take on yeah. some patients Perfect. um yeah. the first step um would be that you need your a letter like an agreement basically okay. of the services they're going to provide and everywhere that i've worked even the very small businesses you usually know that one or two positions that you contract and so you have an attorney write the letter yeah write the agreement um so that's the first thing and it stipulates how they're paid when they're paid um the number of hours that they can work and approval they need if they need if additional hours are needed all of that should be laid out in the letter or okay. agreement so that's the first thing um, but from an HR standpoint, we, it's usually a pretty easy relationship because it's 1099, they're doing their own taxes, they're not on your benefits, they're not, you're not paying any payroll taxes on them. Um, okay. So from an HR standpoint, it's pretty easy, but I would definitely recommend okay. talking to an about that. So the contract just kind of acts as the job description, the benefits outlay, everything all in one. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. And it puts a lot of the responsibility on them that you're not liable for if they don't pay their taxes and things like that. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else that I forgot to ask on the, the hiring side of the fence? Um, not that I can think of, we'll get into employee relations 